The Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. I have many fond memories of my internship days here at Trinity. And one of them is related to this gospel passage for today. I had a wonderful internship committee during my time here. And when the opportunity came up for me to preach a stewardship sermon, which I, of course, had never done before, I asked the group for their input as to how I should go about it. And one of my committee members mentioned that her husband hated stewardship sermons. They always seemed to be big fundraising sales pitches that ladled out huge servings of guilt in an effort to shore up the congregation's finances. From our discussion, I decided that my goal was to write a stewardship sermon for people who hate stewardship sermons. That sermon, based on the gospel reading for today, earned me an award at seminary. So it's it's among many things I thank this congregation for. What makes this passage about the rich man challenging is that it can produce exactly the defensiveness and guilt that sermon listeners hate. What did this guy do that was so horribly wrong? He managed his assets so well that they produced a great deal of wealth, so much that he outgrew his facilities. So he did what any wise manager would do under the circumstances. He expanded his operations. For that he's condemned? Doesn't seem fair. Taken in isolation, this is a simple story of business success that ended tragically when the, owners, when the owner suddenly and unexpectedly died. The lesson to be drawn from it is the importance of planning ahead so that assets go to his family. But this is not a story to be taken in isolation. The story is triggered by a family fight over an inheritance that Jesus is called upon to arbitrate. Jesus refuses to do that because he sees a far greater problem than who is legally entitled to what. A tragedy has occurred. The brothers have just lost a parent. This should be a time when family comes together to offer each other support and comfort in their time of grief. That's how God intends people to act. Instead, their main concern is not what they can do for each other, but how much wealth each can get for himself at the expense of other family. Unfortunately, this is not a rare or outdated problem. During one meeting with a family for the funeral of their father, I had to stand up and separate the shouting, bickering children. I had to tell them to sit down and remember that this, of all times, was an occasion to show respect for the parents who loved and nurtured them, and to show some love for the family bonds that held them together. The problem Jesus sees here is that people are so concerned with material wealth that they lose sight of what is important in life. The parable is not a lecture about business practices. It's a story about priorities. In Matthew 6, Jesus made this very clear when he came right out and said that we make a choice between God and wealth. The overwhelming guilt hits us when we interpret this as saying you can either have wealth, which is clear and tangible and right in front of your face and you can enjoy it right now, or you can trade that in for what's behind that curtain, the invisible and mysterious benefits of religious faithfulness. What's it going to be? It's not a choice most of us want to make. When our oldest son was small, 
But we often subscribe to the parental advice of offering him a choice between two acceptable alternatives, option A or B, thinking we were generously giving him some control over his life. That strategy blew up because invariably he wanted option C. <laughs> That's where we are with this dilemma. We don't like the choice that Jesus offers. No, how about we get both Jesus and wealth in a package deal? And that totally misses what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that life is a choice between miserable poverty, which somehow would make God happy, or a life of luxury, which God finds offensive. The good things of creation are gifts from God, just as faith is a gift from God. God gives both generously. One of the things that angers God above everything else is seeing the poor of the world denied those gifts of creation. That must mean that these things are good and that God wants us to have them. The choice is not between something good, faith, and something evil, wealth. The choice is whom will you serve? It's a simple first commandment issue. God put the wealth of creation here for us to share, not to worship. A world that worships wealth more than it worships God is destined for trouble because the first order of faith is, you shall have no other gods. There are numerous folk stories in our culture about people who sell their souls to the devil, people who out of greed or desperation are enticed by promises of wealth. And in every story told on this subject, they come to regret it because they find that their new master is a tyrant. In today's gospel, Jesus does not say wealth is bad. He warns us to be careful with it. Wealth is a cruel and jealous master. Wealth is never satisfied. If wealth is your priority in life, it will demand more and more of you. You will never reach a moment at which that master will let you rest. You will never know a moment of real peace. The foolish farmer had so much wealth, he did not know what to do with it all. Yet his number one priority in life was building a bigger warehouse so that he could store even more wealth. Because after all, he didn't have enough. Surrounded by abundance, he thought he needed more, and so he wasted his life. I've shared with all of my confirmation students over the years, beginning right here at Trinity, the story of a biology experiment that told why this attitude is so common. The captain of my cross-country team at Luther College was a brilliant student who designed his own independent study with rats. We were at a track team reunion just a few weeks ago where I asked him to confirm my fuzzy details of my memories of that experiment. In an era before PETA, he was able to implant an electrode in the hypothalamus of rats, the area of the brain known to be the center of feelings of pleasure and fulfillment. This electrode was hooked up to a little push bar in a cage. Every time a rat touched the bar, it would get a jolt of euphoria. It took a few days for the rats to figure this out, but once it did, it was all over. The rat kept coming back to the bar for more with increased frequency. It became so obsessed with that little jolt of electricity that it could not focus on anything else. It did not eat, it did not drink, it did not sleep. By the end, it was pressing the bar 4,000 times an hour and literally starved itself to death. Surrounded by more food and water than it needed, in a nurturing, healthy environment, the rat lived in its own world of scarcity in which it could not get enough to survive. Now, we human beings aren't as stupid as rats, are we? We would never do anything so ridiculous, would we? Do you know how many billions of dollars American society spends on jolting the hypothalamus? The amount of time and money spent on entertainment and comfort and convenience increases every year and crowds out those things that bring life, food, water, health, education, and spiritual concerns. We cut programs that provide these things for those in need, claiming we don't have any choice because we live in a world of scarcity. We blame it on God for not giving us enough, but Wisconsin spends $1 billion more per year on excessive alcohol consumption than on higher education. Like the rat, we create a world of scarcity in the middle of a bounty of creation. Jeff Hayden is the author of more than 30 books, including four business and investment titles that were number one bestsellers. 
He spent most of his career rubbing shoulders with the 1% of this country. In an article for Inc. Magazine, Hayden wrote this, One day I'd like to meet someone who is, in fact, rich. Sometimes I think I found one, but I'm always wrong. Someone who can now afford a fabulous new house complains of the work needed to maintain it. A man who has just doubled his income groans because his taxes are higher. A woman who has just landed her dream job is bummed because now her daily commute is a half hour longer. It seems that no one I meet is actually rich, and no one is actually happy. Wealth does not share power with the peace that Jesus offers. Those who worship wealth may try to keep a foot in both worlds, but wealth simply will not allow it. Jesus said clearly, you cannot worship both. And he's echoing the same warning that saturates the Old Testament. In the 8th century BC, the kingdom of Israel was overrun with wealth worship. This created a huge gap between the wealthy and the rest of society. God sent prophets, one after another, to warn them that this is not tolerable in God's world. Stop this worship of wealth before it leads to your ruin. Easier said than done. Wealth is a cruel master and it does not let go easily. Even in the face of these powerful prophecies, the Israelites could not make the change. Their nation, supposedly God's shining, hill, shining light on a hill by which the world would be blessed, was destroyed. The issue Jesus brings up in these verses is not just some curious history that applies to a long-deceased ancient culture. Wealth inequity has been growing in this country since the Great Depression. 95% of economic gains in the past decade have gone to the top 1%. Worldwide, eight wealthy individuals own as much wealth as half the human race. For those at the top, that's quite an accomplishment if you're into wealth worship. Mission accomplished. You'd expect to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Rest now from your labors. Sorry, that doesn't work. If wealth is your master, you haven't done anything yet. That yawning gap between haves and the rest of society is just a start. Wealth needs more and more. Can you imagine a time or circumstance when the gap is large enough? when the haves finally decide that they have enough wealth. It will never happen as long as people worship wealth because wealth as a god is never satisfied. It will always crave more. Wealth is a powerful drug and once in the grip of its addiction, it is very difficult to get free from it. Those who worship it will live in constant fear of losing what they have. They will never know peace. Wealth is worshiped a great deal more in this country than is God. We put in God we trust on our currency because it lets us pretend that we trust God more than we do money, when let's be honest, when push comes to shove, most people trust in money a lot more than they do God. Wealth is a cruel master, which is why in the midst of so much misery, Jesus presents an alternative. The Gospels show us that God is a master who satisfies, who offers life, who offers freedom to live as God designed us to do. Wealth rules through fear, fear of not having enough, fear that if we don't keep chasing this God of wealth and bowing down to it, we will in the end end up miserable and in poverty. God rules through hope and love. God takes away the fear that drives us crazy and brings out the worst in us. It prevents us from being the people we are meant to be. God gives us the hope and love that brings out the best in us. Be careful to note the distinction Jesus made. This is not a screed against the wealthy. It's a warning against those, whether rich or poor or in between, who worship wealth. There are people in this world who are very rich who do not worship wealth. Bill Gates may be as good an example as any, although I'm not ready to recommend him for sainthood yet. When I wrote a bio biographical chapter on him in a book a number of years ago, it was not one of my favorite assignments. Gates was admired for one thing in life, his ability to make money. I found little evidence that anyone admired him for anything else. It wasn't the happy story. I don't like to judge people, but honestly, I could hardly stand to write about him when he appeared to be just another case of someone seduced by the god of wealth and empty promises. 
Given how cruel and jealous that master is, I never expected him to escape from it. But it appears that Gates has. He remains one of the wealthiest men in the world, but in recent years, thanks to the influence of his wife, he has been worshiping at a different altar, following a different master, a master that delivers on the promise of new life, that frees him from the wealth rat race to fulfill the more satisfying purpose of using that wealth to try to make the world a better place. I don't know how religious he is, but I can tell he is serving a different master. And from what I hear, Gates is a far happier man searching, serving this new master. There are people of modest means who worship at the altar of God rather than the altar of wealth. There are also people who have almost nothing in this world who are satisfied, who worship God and only God will they serve. Members of religious orders, relief workers, young idealists, their master has given them a purpose in life that provides them with real peace. On the other hand, there are poor people as well as rich in the world who worship wealth. It consumes them, turns them into a life of despair, jealousy, bitterness, or crime. Wealth is not the issue. Worship of wealth is. Jesus is saying, don't sell your soul to the God of wealth. And don't overestimate your ability to escape that God's clutches. If you truly believe in God, that God loves you, then the words of Psalm 46 are true. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be changed, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. I heard that faith expressed by my father at the very end of his life. At a funeral of a friend, when he could not help but contemplate impending death, he said to me with a smile, I can't wait for what happens next. When your priorities are right, when God is your master, there's nothing to be anxious about. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all the rest will fall into place. Strive first for the kingdom and live life as God meant you to live. Let go of fear, shake off the bonds of slavery that the cruel master of wealth has fashioned for you. Live free and in peace without fear under the rule of the kindest, most loving master you can ever imagine. Amen.